But first, yesterday evening, Ben Wallace announced he would step down as Defence Secretary at the next reshuffle and resign as an MP at the next election. This followed a turbulent week for NATO as its members continued to squabble over the timing of Ukraine's accession to the alliance and some states saying Ukraine ought to be a little bit more thankful to the West. Former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has used his weekly column, if you haven't read it already, to call on the West to accept Ukraine into the NATO fold sooner rather than later. So I've got a few questions. Would this be the right move? Does Ukraine belong in NATO? Would such a move make us safer? And do you have faith in NATO as a military alliance? So joining me to debate this is the director of World Right, Kerry Dingle, and the defence editor at the London Evening Standard, Robert Fox. Robert, I'll start with you. NATO, there's been quite a lot of contention over it over the years. Uh, we saw at the summit many calls for Ukraine to join the bloc. Do you think that should be an aspiration for the current members? Yes, it's an aspiration. And you're quite right to use that word. It's the terms and the timing at which uh, Ukraine should join. We got a little closer to it at Vilnius as to saying when it should join, but I thought it was probably too slow and too ambiguous. And it looked a bit like, uh, I quoted the great Yogi uh, Berra, the uh, baseball coach of Deja Vu all over again, because in 2008 at Bucharest in April, the aspiration of Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova to join the alliance was spelt. It was supported by David Miliband, then the foreign uh, secretary, and the uh, George W. Bush uh, administration. But the terms under which it would happen and the terms under which Ukraine could join were not spelled out. Mm. That proved disastrous because it pushed even further Russia to react, and there was war in Georgia within three months. Kerry. What are your reservations about this military alliance? Um, hi, Emily. Well, I think NATO is a sclerotic Cold War institution that really we do have to ask, especially this week, what's its purpose? You know, if um, NATO is about protecting borders and national sovereignty and nation states, what's it doing? Ukraine certainly doesn't need promises. We know it needs weapons to win. And you have to ask, you know, what is NATO really about? It would seem that for a lot of countries, um, NATO is a way of contracting out responsibility for standing up for national sovereignty. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians are doing the dying while NATO does the pontification. And I, I do not see what purpose or function it serves. Robert, would you agree with Kerry there that it may have lost some of its sense of purpose? It may not be as worthwhile as some might say. What's your take on that? Well, the conditions have always been critical, and a lot of the criticism, frankly, has been levelled by NATO members. I agree that uh, NATO had to redesign itself and as to whether it really did have a future after 1989. It was a defensive alliance with a particular task when it began in 1949, and we've got the 75th anniversary uh, next year, and it was to defend the North Atlantic European area of allies against a growing perceived threat from the Soviet Union and its allies, which eventually became the Warsaw Pact. Now, once the wall came down and that was over, was this really needed? Yes, there was outreach to Russia. But it was decided that NATO was needed because it's, it's a mutual agreement. It is actually there for the defense of national sovereignty. Um, yes, it does seem very unwieldy at times, and I've been foremost amongst critics about the way it has done business. But it is the way you do the kind of business. And the way uh, that arms have been provided by these powers, as much as they possibly can, and a lot of us have been caught out uh, uh, with how short our mm. armaments and our ammunition stocks have been. But it has gone through the NATO clearinghouse at Ramstein, for example. You have the collection and coordination of the weaponry that goes forward. And a lot of the advice and training for the Ukrainians is managed principally by four powers, the US, the UK, Germany, 
and France. Mm. Now, without the NATO mechanism and structure, it would be very, very difficult for individual countries to operate on their own. And the idea that my colleague has given that we're giving minimal support to Ukraine is actually, frankly, if I may say so, complete nonsense. Quite what is worrying at the moment for a somebody like me, is that they have not given quite in the right place the right kind of mm. weaponry, but they've given a hell of a lot and they've provided the training and wherewithal. It's not necessarily a recipe uh, for success, but the kind of things that have been delivered, I mean, things that have been delivered, particularly on the initiative now that he's leaving, let's mm. give him credit where it's due, at the initiative of Ben Wallace, for example, yeah. really did help sa save the day. It is a cooperative effort. There are frictions, but uh, the interesting thing about Ukraine is the train has left the station. This is the message for Putin and his allies. Ukraine is joining the West. How you bind it into the West now mm. is a big question, but I have no doubt that Ukraine must join NATO and it will be a very worthy partner of it. Well, there you go, Kerry. One of my quibbles about NATO is that we spend so much money on defence spending and other countries don't pay their way as much. Is that something you're concerned about? What would you replace NATO with? Nothing? No military alliance? No defence alliance? Well, I think it's, you know, NATO's a club. Um, and, you know, global politics, international relations, geopolitics, you know, different countries and leaders on behalf of the demos, with the support of the demos, talking to each other, is a really good thing. But I think this is a club that's lost its way, lost its teeth. Um, some countries and, you know, the NATO club are happy to use Ukraine um, to prosecute their own hostility uh, to Russia, but they're not prepared. Yes, Britain has given, you know, a, a certain amount of uh, weaponry. Ukraine doesn't have the air power that it really needs. But it must be said, Russia must be really thinking and clear that NATO and Western countries won't do anything, look really weak. And I yeah. think, you know, a lot of people have said, oh, well, NATO pushed Russia. It was NATO's expansion that forced Russia's hand. You know, there's no doubt that NATO wound Russia up. That's absolutely true and failed to integrate Russia more when it could have uh, in the past. But I think today what we're seeing is that Russia is acting on its own volition, must take entire responsibility for the barbaric invasion that it's prosecuted. And it must see NATO as a bit of a joke because it, you know, where, what is it doing? Oh, you can join us after the end of the war. What, what's that about for Ukrainians? You know, you can see why Zelensky um, and Ukrainians want to be in NATO. Absolutely, of course they can. They do. They think it might help them under Article 5. But in, in, oh, Kerry, in I'm gonna, seriousness, um, um, not going to do anything. Well, I'm just going to have to go back to Robert before we finish up. Um, you were shaking your head at Kerry there. What were you going to say? Just oh, very quickly. Oh, goodness gracious. We are a bit adrift here because NATO is a democratic organisation with its own democratic assembly. And that's why some of its decision making at times can seem a bit muddled, but it does have to go back to the delegates and the delegates come up from the parliament. It is a democratic organization and it is prosecuting national sovereignty. I mean, some of them, I'm afraid what we were hearing from my colleague is the kind of stuff that I deal with day in, day out from the Moscow propaganda stations when I'm broadcasting uh, to, 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 the, to, to, the, to the Middle East. Yes, Russia was provoked. No, Russia, NATO was weak in the outrage mm. because it was so difficult to do the outrage in the Wild East and Yeltsin years. But Russia guaranteed the national sovereignty of Ukraine. This you cannot get out of in the, Bucharest, uh, the, in the Budapest Accords of 1994. And this is a violation. And this is why the frontline uh, countries, not just the Baltics, but also Poland and now the Nordics, really do see this mm. as a real threat. And if you don't think this is a real threat, look to your cyberspace, look to your telecommunications, and they're at it quite assiduously. Thank you very much indeed, Robert Fox, Defence Editor at the London Evening Standard. And